We are now ready to embark on the next chapter in our curve fitting discussion, okay? This is a very, very dear topic to me, uh, regression analysis. And I really enjoy, it's one of my favorite topics that I teach in this class, okay? And uh, I put all my heart in the slides for this chapter. Well, half of, half of my heart, the other half goes to ODEs. So um, I really enjoy teaching this chapter. However, I'd like to know how many of you have done regression, are familiar with, re the slides are up, by the way. How many of you, like, if you've seen regression before, just say, okay, all right. Did you take it in high school or who took it with Professor Silcox? Stats, okay, okay, in high school? Okay, okay. So, you know, a good mix, um, which means we're, that's usually the case every year. What that means is that I'm gonna revisit many of the topics that you've seen before, okay? At times, it might seem that, oh yeah, I've seen this, I know how to do this. But I'm hoping that you're gonna get a different perspective, a different message, a different way of interpreting regression, a different way of looking at regression in this, in this class than in your other classes. We are gonna dig under the hood, we're gonna go deeper than you've probably ever seen. We're gonna understand meanings of a lot of things from simple things like standard deviation um, interpreted in a different way, what we mean by standard error, what the R squared value means. You'll be able to predict um, if a set of data just visually looking at it, um, you'll have the tools to say whether a regression is gonna have an R squared coefficient of one or something close to zero, okay? Just by visually looking at it. All right, now pretend you don't know anything about regression. Your only initial condition, pretend that, okay? Your only initial condition, I have to learn to pretend a lot with, with my two kids, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's fun sometimes to pretend. So pretend you don't know anything about regression, but your only initial condition, the only thing you know so far about curve fitting, we are living in the world of, of curve fitting now, you only know interpolation. And with interpolation, we learned that we can only weave points together through the, cur through the curve, excuse me. So we're putting a curve to represent a bunch of data. That curve has to go through each and every point. Keep that in mind, okay? That's the only thing you know about curve fitting. We will begin with a story, okay? Theme music in the background, okay? Let's see if we can turn off the lights a little bit, okay? It's a completely made up story, okay? Who knows bones? Okay, okay, there's still, still some in this generation who have watched Bones, okay. So I'm gonna use Bones, the Bones character, to present this story. And apparently, so for those of you who don't know this character, it's a TV show that ran, I, I think it's, it's done now, ran for several, several years, tens of seasons. Um, it's about a forensic, forensic anthropologist who uses science and, you know, scientific methods to kind of investigate um, um, uh, murders and things like that. So she was called to inspect a burial site that was discovered in an undisclosed location. It's a top secret operation, okay? And then um, she goes to the site and she only finds a few bones that are left on that site, including a femur, okay? Femur is the bone in your leg, all right? Now, she is tasked with identifying the height of the individual to whom the femur corresponded, okay? Among other things and et cetera, but the, the thing, primary thing she needs to, to do is identify the height of the femur because they need to compare with some database or something, height of the person just from the femur. All she knows is that the femur length is 43 centimeters, all right? Now, she quickly rushes to her anthropology book, okay? And digs up some data that correlates or that shows a relation between a person's height and femur length. Apparently, these anthropologists were smart enough to hypothesize that there's a relation between your femur length and your height, okay? Which is great, and they collected a lot of data. And so she plots the data in Python. What do you do when you're first presented with data? 
Okay, you flirt with the data, you look at it, so she plots the data in Python. She plots the height versus the femur length. This is the data that she collected from her anthropology book. Now, what's interesting is that you will see that the data doesn't follow one particular pattern. It's kind of all over the place. It's scattered all over. That's why we use a scatter plot. We don't use a plot with lines connected. It's a scatter. The data is scattered around the plot. What's also interesting is that for the same femur length, you could get two different heights, right? It's not exact science. Maybe the kid drank more milk than usual, you know, when they were growing up, and apparently you get a little taller, okay? And so you might get two, two heights for the same femur length. And I think that data point is 40, 45, hold on. So 44 and 44, you get two heights, 168 and 169 centimeters, okay? So then she remembers her numerical methods class, okay? And she attempts to represent the data using interpolation because she's after the height of the individual at 43 centimeters, somewhere over here, right? So what does she do? She tries to do interpolation. So she does a linear interpolant and she gets this. And she's like, well, this is, doesn't make sense. Even if I interpolate between those, those two points, well, that doesn't really make sense because over here, there's a drop in height, right? So a linear interpolant is not a good model for this data. Wouldn't you agree? Right? Then she tries polynomial interpolation, which doesn't even work in this case because you have, in, in, it's unsolvable in this case because you have two y values for the same x value, okay? So the matrix is gonna crash, gonna do something different. The inversion is, is not gonna work. And it shows something that's completely rubbish, okay? Um, apparently, if your femur height is, if your femur length is like, what, 47, then you get shorter, and then if it is like 49, then you get, you know, infinitely taller. It doesn't make sense, okay? She then thinks about the data and notices that the data has a trend, right? The trend is, in general, overall, as the femur length increases, the height of the person increases. And how does it increase? Kind of linearly, right? It's just along that trajectory. It doesn't go exponentially. It doesn't go like a square root or a logarithm. It's just kind of straight line, right? It just goes like that, straight line, okay? Something along this, okay, like this. Okay, now remember your initial condition that I told you about. You only know about interpolation. I'll ask you a question. Based on what you know so far about curve fitting or interpolation, can you pass a straight line through more than two data points? We have more than two data points here, right? We have a bunch of data. So how could you draw a straight line with more than two data points? So you cannot put a straight line. You cannot connect more than two data points with a straight line unless they're all on that line, right? But in this case, you cannot. So we need something else. We need another way to try to fit a straight line into those data, okay? So finally, having taken numerical methods at the U, she decides to do something called regression on the data. Did you talk to Bones for like standard or something? Bones? Yeah. I don't know. No, she's, uh, she comes to the U. Okay, let's pretend, let's pretend. <laughs> this is Bones 2.0, okay? Ma <laughs> now with regression, she can define a curve that captures the trend of the data, the spirit of the data, if you will, okay? It doesn't have to go through the data exactly through each and every point because after all, those data are not an exact science, right? Because there's so many parameters involved in our growth in this case, right? It's not an exact science, but there's a trend. So let's just capture that trend get an idea of what it looks like and so that we can use it to make, to make predictions, excuse me. So keep that in mind. With regression, we can define a curve that captures or represents the trend of the data like, like she inferred. And indeed, if you do that regression with a straight line, you get this line in green or blue, whatever that color is, turquoise, and you get an equation for it. That line is y equal x plus 123.2 centimeters, okay? Then she can 
evaluate that line at 43 centimeters, which is the, the femur length that was found at the burial site, and she predicts that the person's height was around 166.2 centimeters. Okay? Emily? Yeah, so we're going to get there. Yeah, there's, yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay. We're just kind of trying, pretending we don't know anything about regression. Okay? You, you don't. Okay. Well, we're going to learn what we mean by that variance. For regression, it's going to be called standard error. Okay? But it is the equivalent of a variance. We'll get to all of them. All right. So let's do the learning objectives first, and then we can get to it. All right? Um, at the end of this chapter, you should be able to do the following, hopefully. Um, you should be able to know how to define and work with least squares regression. In other words, given a set of ob observations and a model curve with unknown parameters, you'll be able to find those parameters that minimize the square of the error between the model and the observations. We will learn what all of that means in the next few lectures, okay? This chapter is going to be one of, ha has at least four or five lectures in it, okay? So it's pretty long. We'll be able to define what we mean by linear regression, and it is not regression to a straight line. Okay? In this class, I make a clear distinction that linear regression does not mean regression to a straight line. Instead, I use words regression to a straight line, regression to a quadratic, reg regression to a sinusoidal form. All of those are linear regressions, okay? because the system of equations that governs the coefficients is linear. That's what I mean by linear regression as opposed to nonlinear regression. Think about our interpolation with arbitrary basis functions. We could have linear interpolation in the sense that the model results in a linear system of equations for the coefficients, okay? And that's very easy to solve, as opposed to nonlinear. Define least squares regression, formulate the governing equations for lin linear regression with arbitrary basis functions using least squares derivation. So we will be able to go beyond the straight line. We'll be able to fit functions with logs and cosines and exponentials, okay, all of that. Define and compute the mean standard deviation and standard error, which are related to the variance that Emily mentioned. Define and compute the R squared value and what we mean by it. Visually identify which set of data has higher standard deviation than another. Same thing. Um, visually be able to inspect if regression will result in a higher, um, in a high R squared value or a low one. Create code in Python for linear regression, both that implements our own derivations and that uses existing functions, okay? In, we are engineers, we're gonna go beyond what a technician could use, okay? If you're just getting a certificate in data science, you'll be able to only use FSolve or polyfit, right, or curve fit, but you don't necessarily know what goes into the details. So over here, we're pushing that standard a little bit further so that you can learn what goes behind the scenes. Define and use what we call the normal equations, and these will allow us to generalize linear regression to, an ar to arbitrary sets of um, linear regression models. It's a very powerful um, tool, okay? Convert certain nonlinear models into linear models for linear regression analysis, formulate the equations for nonlinear regression, and the cherry at the top of the cake is solve nonlinear regression qu qu problems using Newton's method. So it brings us back to F-solve. All of those, we're going to have F-solve and numpy.linalgebra.solve under our, under our tool belt, okay? Okay. First, I want you to learn how to drive before we understand how the car operates. So as has been customary in the course, we're going to learn to do regression in Python first. So we have a little win. We're happy. Okay, we can do regression. And then we're going to spend hours um, studying what goes behind the scenes. Okay. But first, the basic idea of regression, like we kind of just discussed with the bones example, um, is, is, is if you have a bunch of input data, say, these, date, these scattered data over here, then your objective is, say, you know, I'm going to come up with a model curve. Maybe I think the data over here looks like it's a square root model. Okay, so I'm going to create a model curve with a bunch of unknown parameters, like, you know, alpha square root to the uh, alpha square root of beta x, okay? And then your objective is to find alpha and beta, all right? 
And the purpose of regression is to fit this model curve to capture the trend of the data. We will need a condition for that fit. How do we fit it? That's where the least squares comes in. But first, let's do this in Python, okay? Basic regression in Python, lo and behold, polyfit. Remember, when we used polyfit for interpolation, we had one parameter that I told you, always put that parameter equal to the number of points minus one, right? That was the degree of the polynomial, okay? So if you had 100 data points, I told you put 99. If you had three data points, I told you put two. Now we're gonna relax that assumption. If you put any other number that is less than n number of data points minus one, polyfit is gonna give you a regression, okay? And it all boils down to that degree um, argument over there. If degree equal one, then polyfit is gonna result in a regression to a straight line. If degree equal two, then polyfit is gonna result in a regression to a quadratic. If degree equal three is gonna result to a regression to a cubic. Now clearly, I'm assuming you have hundreds of data points, okay? Right? So if you have four points and put degree equal three, you're gonna get an interpolation, not a regression, okay? But assuming you have a lot more points than your degree, then degree equal one gives you a regression to straight line, degree equal two gives you a quadratic and so on, okay? Right now we're dealing with degree equal one, that's the simplest type of regression we're gonna be doing um, in the next few slides. So we're gonna work with that. If you don't remember what polyfit does, um, given xi and yi data, those are your input data, Okay, the xi is the independent observed variable, yi is the response variable. So in our case, xi is the femur length, and yi is the person's height, and degree is gonna be equal to one in our case, that we're, we're gonna do right now. So you do polyfit, gives you a bunch of coefficients. Those coefficients are gonna be these coefficients over here, a1, a0, a1, a0, a2, and so on, okay? And then you use polyval to evaluate that those polynomial coefficients at a desired value, all right? So we're gonna do this in Python. Go ahead and download this notebook from your canvas, um, either in the files directory, Jupyter Notebooks, Regression Activities, or in the Modules um, link on your left, go to Modules, Regression, and the first regression activity, okay? Height versus femur with gaps. All right, let's download that and we'll work through the data together. look like this, let's see. Okay. So I listed the data here for you and I also already put it in arrays for you. So let's read the problem description. The height of a person versus femur length is given by the following data. So we have these data that are given to us from Bones' anthropology book. Um, femur length, that's our XI data and the person's height, that those are our YI datas, okay? First, let's get some boilerplate out of the way and import matplotlib and numpy, okay? So for this, I'm gonna use my standard matplotlib inline. You should already have that in the notebook. And then uh, import matplotlib. And then from numpy, import numpy as MP. And also I'm gonna import polyfit and polyval, right? Because we're gonna use polyfit to do regression for us, all right? Then I define the data over here just simply by putting it by hand. You could read from a text file if you have thousands of data points. That's beyond the point here. But these are the data, xi and yi. And then first thing to do is plot the data, all right? And my recommendation always is to plot a scatter, okay? Do not plot, do not connect the dots. Always plot a scatter. Okay, 
always plot a scatter, it gives you a better perspective of the data. If the data looks nice and has a good trend, then connect it with dots, with, with lines, sorry. But if not, just always plot a scatter. Okay? Okay, who's still working on this? So we're gonna do regression next without knowing what we're doing, unless you've done this before. But assuming we, pretending we don't know regression, we're going to do a regression, just kind of learn how to use it, learn how to drive, and then we'll understand what's going on behind the scenes, okay? Okay, fair enough. Now, my objective is to draw some line in between those data that captures the trend of the data, and I'm claiming to you that this line is going to be the best representation of those data. This is the best we can do to represent those data. It minimizes a bunch of errors and a bunch of other things. It has some properties, but that's the claim here, is that if you use this procedure, this is going to give you the best representation of those data. Now, it all depends on what you choose to be the model curve. Our model curve here is a straight line. Well, data looks linear. Not a quadratic, not a cubic, straight line. That's up to you, that's on you, okay, to choose the model curve. What's on the regression is to find the coefficients on that model curve to make it the best representation, all right? So let's do that. With polyfit, remember, polyfit, the first argument was xi, and the second argument was yi. Okay, so if you, plot, if you shift tab over here, you'll get the function signature. So this is exactly what I'm going to pass. I'm going to give it all the xi data, all the yi data, and then I'm going to ask it to fit a polynomial of degree 1, because that's a straight line. Okay? If we had done degree equal number of points minus 1, it would be an interpolation, be something different. But here we're putting degree one, it's automatically going to give you a regression. Okay? So, in fact, if you look at the function signature, if I go down to degree, degree of the fitting polynomial, um, yeah, in the, in the description on the website, it tells you that it's going to do a regression. So, when you do this, it produces the result of polyfit is a set of coefficients. What are those coefficients? Remember your model curve, okay? Remember your model curve. Those are A1 and A0. So this polyfit results in 1.004x plus 123.2 as your model curve. That is a regression of this data, okay? So now we can go and evaluate and say what is the equation for the straight line. Okay, the equation for the straight line is um, 1.004x plus 123.2. I'm messing up my significant figures here. For all practical purposes, this is just x plus 123.2. Okay, that's the equation of the straight line fit, right? Next. Evaluate the height of the person for a femur length of 42 or whatever, 43 centimeters was the problem statement. Okay, so I'm going to call polyval. To call polyval, the first argument are the coefficients, and the second argument is the value at which I want to evaluate um, the approximation or the, the, the regression. So I'm going to pass it coefs and do 43, just like we did with interpolation, and I get... 166.4, just like we saw on the slides, okay? Now, the best thing to do is to actually visualize that regression line on the original data, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. We now, we not, we now plot the regressed line on top of the original data. So this is the original data, but now I want to plot the regressed line on top of that data. So what do you think I should put here? So this should be A1x plus A0, where A1 and A0 are those values that we just obtained. 
So we can manually put those in, right? So I can manually put um, xi plus 123.2, right? And I can plot this. What? Le, les bleus. <laughs> Thank you. OK, right? That's the line. That's the regression line. It's beautiful. <laughs> Okay, but there's an easier way than having to do all of this. I could just simply call polyval on coefs, using coefs, but on the entire xi data. Polyval is a general function, doesn't care what you're providing it. All it does is it takes the first array and turns it into a polynomial and evaluates that polynomial at those values. That's all it does. So if I do this, I'm going to get the same exact thing. Polyval coefs at xi is going to do a1 xi plus a0 and apply it at all the xi values. Okay? Much faster way of plotting your, doing your, plotting your data. Okay? Regression. You just did regression to a straight line. I avoid calling it linear. It is a linear regression, but more specifically, it's a regression to a straight line. Would polyval be like faster on the computer, computing line? Uh, not necessarily, but it's just easier because what you would have to do maybe is define another function, another uh, Python routine that implements that function or type it in. It's just polyval is just much easier, yeah, more convenient. Okay, so now let's try to regress to a quadratic. Let's say one of you says, no, 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 no. The data is quadratic. Well, all I have to do is go, go change degree to 2 over here. And with degree equal 2, I'm going to get three coefficients, a0, a1, and a2. And over here, they're listed in reverse order. So this is a2, this is a1, and this is a0. Okay? Now, you will notice that the coefficient that multiplies x squared is very small. Because the data is really more linear, more straight line than it is a quadratic. But still, it works. Okay? And then the equation would be 2.5 x squared, 2.5 10 to the minus 3 x squared plus 7.76, 0 0.77 times x plus 128.3. Okay? And then you can evaluate that at 43 centimeters, still about the same. And you can even plot it here. It still looks like a straight line, OK? So the assumption that the model for this data being a straight line is a good one, OK? Now, how do we assess whether this regression is a good regression or not? We're going to have to wait a little bit. Because Python, despite how amazing it is, it is annoyingly as heck to try to get the R-squared value and these measures out of it that will tell us how good a fit is, OK? So we're going to postpone that for a little bit later. But if you were to do this in Excel or uh, Pages or Keynote, and you would fit the line, it will give you an R-squared value. It would tell you, oh, yeah, this is 99% fit or 88% fit, you know, the, whatever that means, OK? But that's it. You just did regression to a straight line or a quadratic or a cubic. You can change degree to whatever you want, OK, as long as it's less than the number of points, much less than the number of points, you're doing regression for all you care. This is Python regression, very basic way. There's other, another, other ways to do it in Python, but this is the simplest way that we could do. Okay? Yeah? Could you use regression with, like, an exponential function? You mean the model curve to be an exponential? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and, and with an exponential model, we will see... You could either have a linear regression model with exponentials or a nonlinear one, depending on where the coefficients are. And sometimes with an exponential, you can convert it to a linear model. It's easier to do a regression on the linear model than on the nonlinear one. Okay? We'll cover all of that. Good question. Okay. So are we ready to dig under the hood? Let's see. Or if I can find my cursor first. Okay, under the hood, there's a lot of moving parts to what you are able to do in just two lines of code. 
polyfit and polyval, right? That's all you had to do. There's a lot that goes behind the scenes, okay? I know you're also excited to learn about it. So we're going to dig deeper now and see what's going on specifically with what I call least squares regression. Now, I want to enforce this definition, um, re enforce the idea that says, what do we mean by least squares regression? Definition. Given a set of observations, so those are femur length and person's height, and a model curve with unknown parameters. Our model curve here was a one x plus a naught. The unknowns were a one and a naught, or alpha x plus beta. Okay, or you could have another model curve, could be alpha e to the beta x. Okay, or alpha cosine beta x plus gamma sine x. That's a model. Okay, that has parameters alpha and beta or a naught, a one. Okay. With regression, you will find those parameters, the alpha, beta, the coefficients, such that the sum of the squares of the error between the model and the observations is a minimum. That's why we call it least squares. It's the minimum, it's the least of the sum of the squares of the error. That's a special type of regression. And frankly, it is the foundation of machine learning. The cost function is machine learning, and machine learning is nothing, nothing more than a weighted sum of the least squares. If we have time at the end of the semester, we will do a couple of lectures on neural networks, okay? Okay, so let's do a derivation. Remember this picture that I showed you earlier? We had some input data points and a model curve. Now we're going to try to derive regression from this. If you look at the distance between the input data and your model curve, right? So those distances, those are an error, right? That's the error between your model and the input data. And in a way, it's a true error because it's the error between your prediction and what you observed, right? So those are the errors. And what we're going to try to do is adjust this curve so that the aggregate sum of all of those errors is the minimum, is the absolute minimum of all possible variations of this curve. So when you think of a curve that has parameters, as you change the parameters, it might make it bend a little bit, kind of move a little bit here like that, adjust, right? So we're going to find those parameters such that the total sum of the errors is the absolute minimum of all possible curves, OK? First, we'll start with least regression to a, to a straight line. So we're going to start very slowly, step by step. It's going to be tedious and boring. And then psh, we're going to shoot up into the more um, difficult models. Okay. So I'm going to give you three data points. Again, input data in blue. These data points are given by xi and yi. In other words, x1 and y1, x2, y2, and x3 and y3. Okay. Then I'm going to assume that, I'm not going to assume, I'm actually going to posit that these data are best represented by a model that is a straight line. I'm going to draw a straight line. I don't know where this straight line falls exactly. I'm just going to draw a straight line, right? Because I haven't derived the equation for that straight line yet. The formula for that straight line, you need to have a formula for your curve before you do anything, is a1x plus a0. And the unknowns are shown in red. OK. Next, I need to define an error between my model curve and my input observations. OK? So what can I do? I can evaluate that model curve at the input data. So for example, if I evaluate my model curve at the input data point of x1, right? So that gives me a value of f1 is a1, x1, plus a0, right? Because a1 and a0 are the unknowns. x1 is that input data, right? So that gives me a value of f1. Same thing for x2. Gives you f2 is a1, x2, plus a0. And finally, for the third data point, x3, f3 is a1, x3, plus a0. The red squares are the, are the model predictions at the input data. 
when we did interpolation, the curve went through each blue point, right? So we didn't have a difference between y1 and f1 and y2 and f2 and y3 and f3. There was no difference. It was interpolation. It, by definition, it went through each and every point. In this case, it does not. No, absolutely no assumption that it goes through those data points. It might. You'd just be lucky. But it doesn't, and it shouldn't. OK. This slide is pretty dense, so let's simplify it. Okay, Simple enough. I only care about the y values right now. The blue ones are the input data points, and the red ones are the model prediction. The model prediction, they fall on that curve, on the model curve by definition, right? So now the difference between f and y is an error. This is the first error. It's f1 minus y1. The second error, f2 minus y2. Third error is f3 minus y3, and so on, right? I'm just doing three points to help you fix the idea in your head. Well, f1 minus y1, y1 minus f1, it's not going to matter. We will see in a minute, OK? But those are the errors now. We have an idea of what the error is between our model prediction or model and our input data. Unfortunately, we still don't know what the curve is. But we're going to use those errors and minimize them to find that curve. We're going to find errors before We're going to find the curve such that all the errors are a minimum of all possible curves, right? OK. Here's the idea. Find A0 and A1 such that the total error between Fi and Yi is a minimum. In other words, I want an aggregate measure of E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, et cetera, right? Now, we learned about how to measure the error of a vector or an array, right? We called that the norm. So a definition for the error is simply the Pythagorean norm of all the errors. In this case, I'm going to call that S. I don't know why they call it S. The entire literature, they call it S. And it's so annoying, but we're just going to call it S like they do, OK? And that S is E1 squared plus E2 squared plus E3 squared, right? That's like the Pythagorean norm. If you take the square root of that, it gives you the length of that error vector. Doesn't matter, square root, no square root. We're just going to keep it as is. E1 squared plus E2 squared plus E3 squared, OK? Now, when you expand that, remember E1 is Y1 minus F1 or F1 minus Y1. It doesn't matter because it's squared. I don't care about the sign, OK? E2 and E3, all right? Almost there. However, F i is, or F is A1x plus A0. So F1 is A1x1 plus A0, F2, etc. right? So I want you now to go and substitute F1, F2, and F3 in terms of A0 and A1. Okay? So go ahead and do that by hand okay, on your pen and paper or your, or your tablet. Okay? Fill in the blanks. I want you to express as that total error committed between the model and the input data in terms of A0 and A1. Okay? And also Y1 and y clearly Y1, Y2, Y3 are fixed, right? So in other words, replace F1, F2, and F3 with their values. Just write the expression for S, OK? Nothing further. The square of the error. Is that so? Because they call that also for the, when we go to the variances, SYX and SY, right? It's still S, which is, I guess, the square of the error, sum of the squares. Yeah. Yeah. This is A1. The, the model, remember, these are the unknowns, but they're going to go through all the data points, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know it's tricky. That's why I have you write it by hand. It's tricky. You might be inclined to do a two x two, right? For the uh, for the polyfit, um, I I don't understand the question. <laughs> so like here, you know how um, the poly polyfit poly yeah goes with a one and then a naught. Yeah, 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 yeah. The polyfit does that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what do we got? You should get this formula. Very simple, right? We simply replace F1 by A1 X1 plus A0, F2 by A1 X2 plus A0, and F3 by A1 X3 plus A0. Remember, A1 and A0, they're the same. Those are the two parameters we're finding. Okay? Those are the two parameters we're finding. Now, the challenge... Why, are, why did we have to do this? We're trying to fit a straight line that has only two unknowns into three data points or a hundred data points or a thousand data points. With interpolation, each data point gave us an equation, but here we can't do that because we only need two equations, not a thousand equations. So that's the reason we're doing all of this because with this procedure, what we're going to get are only two equations and two unknowns, and you'll see that. Okay, so now we have an expression for the error in terms of our model curve, right? We don't know what A1 and A0 are, but we're going to now make a statement and say, I want to find A1 and A0. Those are our variables here. Because X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3, etc., those are known data, known values. The only unknowns in this equation are two, A0 and A1. So now I want to find the minimum of S. If you remember your calculus, your multivariate calculus, function is the minimum when its derivatives with respect to each of the independent variables is equal to zero. Just like the derivative of a function of a single variable Okay, has a minimum or a maximum when the derivative is zero. Same thing when the function is multivariate. The function S here is multivariate in terms of A0 and A1. It has two variables, A0 and A1. And it is a minimum if we can satisfy those two conditions. ds by dA0 equal to zero and ds by dA1 is equal to zero. Okay? I'll come back to that note a little later. Now, Go ahead and find those two, do those two derivatives. Differentiate S with respect to A0 and S with respect to A1. If that makes you squeak, okay, wait until the end of, the, of, the, of this chapter. Oh, We're going to have way harder, way harder functions to deal with. Partial derivatives. So you fix everything else and differentiate with respect to A0. Fix everything else, differentiate with respect to A1, partial derivatives. Do it by hand. Remember that U n, the derivative of U to the power n, is n times U prime times U n minus 1. Okay? So the derivative of y1 minus a1 x1 minus a0 squared with respect to a0 is 2 times minus 1 times y1 minus a1 x1 minus a0, right? Same thing for the other ones, okay? Yes, the prime is either respect to A0 or A1. It is pretty easy. It should be pretty easy. Okay?
The more interesting one is with respect to A1, because when you differentiate with respect to A1, you're going to carry out an X1 and an X2 and an X3 outside of those um, parentheses, right? Okay, would you want to? Well, I'm not going to say, I don't know if I got it right. So <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, do you want to chat with your colleagues and maybe you'll explain it better than me. Right. Anyone stuck? I can help you. <coughs> and then set it equal to zero, okay? Yep. Yep. We because it's a system of equations now, right? Okay. Okay, I'll guide you a little bit over here. I'll just do one term from each because they're the same. Okay? So if I'm differentiating with respect to A naught of this first term, Y1 minus A1 X1 minus A naught squared. So I'm differentiating this with respect to A naught. So that's all of it is U to the power N. Derivative is going to be n times u prime, or the derivative of this whole thing with respect to a naught. With respect to a naught, the derivative is simply minus 1. So you get a minus 1 times the whole thing to the power n minus 1, which is y1 minus a1x1 minus a naught. You do the same for all the other terms. With respect to a1, Okay, so we also have y1 minus a1x1 minus a0 squared. Again, you get u to the power n derivative is n times u prime times u n minus 1. So n is 2. Now u prime with respect to a1. We're differentiating with respect to a1. It's minus x1. So you get a minus x1 times u n minus 1. So you get y1 minus a1 x1 minus a0, okay? And you repeat for the other terms, okay? This is what you get, okay? Now, there's no more squares on our unknowns, right? Gorgeous. How many equations do we have? Two. Two. How many unknowns do we have? Two. Do these unknowns show up linearly or non-linearly? Linearly. So we have a system of linear equations with two unknowns. Two equations and two unknowns. Can we solve this? Yes, we can solve this. And we can get A0 and A1. And I claim that when you solve this, that straight line is going to minimize the error the square of the errors, the sum of the square of the errors, you know, it's going to minimize the sum of the square of the errors between the model curve and the input data. Okay? It is the best curve or the best straight line that we can put that can do that. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing. I did this for three data points. Now we're going to do it for an arbitrary or any number of data points. Okay? So I'm going to draw the same figure, but now I'm going to put a lot of input data, x2, x3, and so on, all the way to xn. And each data point has a corresponding y value, so independent variables, dependent or observed variables, y1, y2, y3, all the way to yn. Then we're going to draw a model curve, and that model curve, in this case, only has two parameters, a1 and a0 despite the fact that you could have a thousand input data points. It doesn't matter. Okay? We do the same thing. 
we apply the model curve or the model prediction at each input data. And that gives us F1, F2, F3, all the way to Fn. Okay? So notice how we call things Y for the input data and F for the model curve. Okay? Now we do the same thing. The difference between F and the Fi's and the Yi's defines an error. You have a bunch of errors. E1 is F1 minus Y1. E2 is F2 minus Y2. All the way to N data points. En is Yn minus Fn or Fn minus Yn. Then we define the total error as the Pythagorean norm or the sum of the squares of the errors. E1 squared plus E2 squared plus E3 squared all the way to En squared. In other words, looks like this. Y1 minus F1 squared plus Y2 minus F2 squared plus et cetera, et cetera, plus Yn minus Fn squared. F1 is A1 X1 plus A0. F2 is A1 X2 plus A0. A Fn is A1 Xn plus A0. A1 and A0 are there to stay, okay? They're unchangeable, all right? Now we bring in the summation. And in many ways, this is much easier to write than with the three data points where you had to write each term, right? Now we're just dealing with the summation over all the data points of yi minus fi squared, okay? And fi is a1xi plus a0. So if you plug that back into the formula of the sum of the squares of the error, this is what you get. yi minus a1xi minus a0 sum all squared, okay? Same idea, minimize the error, find A1 and A0 such that this whole summation is a minimum. And that summation is a minimum if and only if dS by dA0 is zero and dS and dS by dA1 is zero concurrently together. Now fill in the blanks. Keep everything in summation form, okay? You only have one term now, okay? You only have one term to differentiate. Remember, you're differentiating with respect to A0 and A1. So your Xi's and Yi's remain in summation, okay? Oh. All you have to do is differentiate. Just take the summation out, differentiate it, and then put the summation back, okay? Yep. Exactly. It's the same thing we did before. But I want you now to write it in summation form to see that you can generalize this procedure. Do you want a paper or something? Okay. <laughs> I don't think I actually have papers. <laughs> At least try to do it, okay? At least try to do it in summation form. All right. We have any answers? Hmm? Hmm? Abigail? Yeah, so I, yeah, with the summation. So the first one, do you do the first one? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the summation, under the summation, good. And what about the second one, ds by da1, Todd? That's correct, under the summation, right? Okay, perfect. It's much easier in this form, frankly, than the other one, because the other one we had like three terms, right? Now what becomes apparent is that with the zero on the right-hand side, you can knock out these negative twos. You don't care about them, right? They don't matter. 
But this is still a system of two equations with two unknowns that show up linearly. A0 and A1, they show up linearly. There's a thousand of those terms, it doesn't matter. They just show up linearly. So we can go ahead and simplify this a little bit further. We're going to split the summation for simplicity. So whenever I'm faced with a system of linear equations, I put the unknowns on the left-hand side and what I know on the right-hand side so I can build a, co a coefficient matrix, okay? So what I want on the left-hand side are terms that contain A0 and A1, and everything else is going to go to the right-hand side. So I'm going to split the summation. First, we got rid of the negative 2. Then you have some yi and then negative a1, some xi, negative minus sum of a0, okay? Because that's a0, sum of 1, okay? And we'll see what that term means. And at the bottom, you have some xi, yi. I'm multiplying xi throughout. Minus a1, sum of xi squared, minus a0, sum of xi, okay? Now we continue rearranging. Now notice here, some a0, so this is what happened, okay, this is what happened, this is this, this goes up, and now some a0 is simply a0 times n, okay, because you're summing a0 n times, that's how many data points you have, that's a0 plus a0 plus a0 plus a0 n times, okay, so that's a0 times n, right, okay, so now we have this, now I want you to write it in matrix form, okay, It's a two by two system of equations, okay? Put the coefficient matrix, put the unknowns, A0 and A1, and put the right-hand side, okay? Don't let the summations mislead you. It's just a symbol. It's just a symbol. And keep it in summation form. Of course. Yeah, because it's a, it's a number, right? So when you sum xi squared or sum xi yi, that's a single number. Because xi and yi, they're known data, right? They're given to you. You're just multiplying 1 43 centimeters times 128, right? It's just a number and adding them all up. Yeah, because you have two equations and two unknowns. Yeah, someone said so? Oh. In red. Right, so we're trying to fit the curve A1x plus A0, right? The xi and yi, they are known data. And our, the whole, everything we've been doing is to find the equations that govern A0 and A1 that minimize that total error, right? Those are the equations, guys. Those are the equations. You solve those, you're going to get the best straight line fit, okay? All right. Yep. Okay, so watch your negative signs. Right, so when you move everything to the right hand side. Yep, so then they all become positive. Right? <laughs> okay, so. Okay. At least try. This is perfect. Perfect. Yep. All right. So, okay. So what I'm going to do, I rearrange the terms. I put all, everything that I know on the left-hand side, every, sorry, all the unknowns, all the coefficients and the unknowns on the left-hand side, and everything I know on the right-hand side this way, coefficient times unknown, coefficient times unknown, okay? Now my unknown vector is A0 and A1, and I can, I can write this in matrix form, okay? Two by two system of equations, n, some xi, some xi, some xi squared. Okay, look at the beautiful pattern. Ethan? And, and, is, and in this case, the people that have a data Yes, yes, okay? So you're summing here over n, okay? I don't put that because it just complicates the nomenclature quite a bit. Okay, and then your unknown vector, A0 and A1, and your right-hand side, some yi, some xi, yi. This is system of linear equations, two unknowns. If you solve this, 
the A0 and A1 that you get, you put them back in that straight line. That straight line is the only straight line that passes through the data that minimizes the sum of the squares of the errors. That's one so that of all possible lines that you can draw throughout those data points, this is the only one that minimizes the sum of the squares of the error. It's a fact, okay? And we claim that that is one way to say this is the best fit for the data, okay? Now, in this case, there is an analytical solution for A1 and A0. I'm giving it to you here just for the sake of, you know, again, if you're on an airplane and you want to do a regression for some reason, you want to have the analytical solution by hand, right? It's some of the things I do when I'm flying, but, okay? Um, I'm just, <laughs> it's just very weird this way. Well, especially when passengers are like, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing, it's just, <laughs> just solving a regression problem. Um, anyway, so one time I was flying to China, actually it was a very long flight, and I was tracking the um, speed at which we were flying and trying to calculate the Mach number. So I collected about 20 data points of our flight Mach number, and I wanted to put a regression line in it. Yeah, my. It shows the Mach number on the screen. It shows the speed, not the Mach number. It shows the speed on the screen, but then I was getting the temperature, also trying to calculate the speed of sound at that altitude, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, nerdy stuff, but it's okay. So, all right, so this is, this is uh, the exact way of doing it, right? Okay, so keep that, you know, in your slides, exact solution. It's kind of nice and simple for back of the envelope calculations. But what we are going to do programmatically is we're going to program the system of equations. Instead of programming A1 and A0 with these annoying summations, we're going to instead learn how to program the governing equations because we're going to explore different models beyond the straight line. So when we go to a quadratic or something more complicated, there's no exact solution like this one. Okay? Let's do this. So we are going to program the system of equations rather than the solution to A0 and A1 because as we move forward in this lecture, in these lectures, we're going to be dealing with different systems of equations that govern different curves. So we might as well just learn how to solve the system of equations, which we kind of do because we know how to, learn to solve systems of linear equations. However, here you need a couple of more tools because the coefficient matrix has summations in it, right? And so we need to be able to create some xi some xi squared, some yi, some xi, yi, okay? So, if you have xi and yi as numpy arrays, then you can build this regression matrix very simply by the following. n is simply the length of xi, okay? Some xi, you just simply type numpy.sum of xi, gives you some xi, okay? Now, some xi squared is numpy.sum xi squared. What's nice about Python, just like MATLAB, it goes element-wise on all operations that you apply on it, okay? So when you take the power of xi, square of xi, it takes each element and squares it, okay? And finally, sum xi, yi is numpy.sum xi, yi. I'm putting code over here, but you will see it in the notebook in a minute, but I'm putting it here for completeness for the slides if, as you're studying later, okay? Now, once you solve, so you build the matrix, you either numpy.solve or invert it, whatever you want. It's a very small matrix, right? Then you solve for A0 and A1. Okay, what do you do with them? You need to build that curve, that model. Then you create a Python routine called my model, okay? And you make it return A1x plus A0, okay? You can use polyval, but... It's not, it might be misleading if your model is not a standard polynomial, okay? So I always recommend you create your model simply by, once you solve A for A0 and A1, you just create a subroutine, a routine in Python for your model that returns A1x plus A0, okay? All right, so let's do this in Python. Let's go back to our um, um, uh, Jupyter notebook that we were working with. 
And just after the polyval and what we did here, we have a subsection on regression to a straight line in the notebook, okay? So this is our regression matrix, okay? And this is what we're gonna build here. So we're gonna just build it, just like we did in the first, in, in the chapter on linear solvers, okay? So n is simply the length of ai, of xi, and our NumPy array is, our, our array, our matrix, is a NumPy array built as, built as a list of lists, okay? So this is the first row, this is the second row. First entry here is gonna be n, then some xi, some xi, and some xi squared. So let's fill in the blanks together. If you can't see in the back, I don't, can't seem to be able to zoom in any further. Okay, so the first entry here is n, which we already um, calculated there. The second entry is np.sum of xi. On the second row, also mp.sum of xi. And the last entry is mp.sum of xi squared. When in doubt, print it out. He's got a bunch of numbers, right? 10, 4, 4, 4, etc. Okay? Next, we construct the right-hand side, which is some xi and some xi yi. And again, do not worry if this is a row or a column vector. Python knows what you're thinking, okay? Knows what you're doing. So just do it like this. Don't overcomplicate this with NumPy matrices and column vectors. It's way, way, it's, it's using a hammer. It's using like a, a excavator to hammer a nail. So don't do that, okay? You don't need that. mp.sum yi, pardon me, Miles. Uh, don't, don't overcomplicate it. Just use the simplest possible way to achieve what you want, okay? Don't, some, of, some are using like pandas and uh, data arrays and data frames. I don't think you need that for these simple problems, okay? Even for most of the problems you're dealing with, all right? So mp.sum yi and np.sum xi times yi, okay? Print the right-hand side. So now we have the coefficient matrix, and we have the right-hand side. We just need to solve it for a naught and a1. Now, watch out for the order of your solution. Some of you might write it as a1 and a0, so make sure you got the ordering right. It doesn't matter how you put it, as long as you're clear about it. We're going to use numpy.linalgebra.solve. For that, the first entry is the coefficient matrix. The second entry is the right-hand side. Look at that. We got A0 and A1, exactly what Polyfit gave us. Okay? Yes? Uh, I have all the same stuff except for the very last thing we just did. Uh, the numbers are For the right hand side is different. Or, no, no, it's the same. Okay. A and B. Uh, yeah, your coefficient matrix is wrong. This entry is wrong. Some xi. Okay. So now, okay. Now, what is this first number? This is a naught, right? Because we solved the system in that order. The first and the first variable was a naught. The second variable was A1, okay? So this is A0 and this is A1. Now, to be able to see this data, this curve, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna extract A0 from my solution and A1 from my solution and build a model for it as a Python subroutine, okay? This is gonna return A1x plus A0, okay? That, that model takes in as an argument Simply a one single unknown, okay, x, because it's a, a, it's a function of x only, okay? So I'm going to return a1 times x plus a0. That's it. All right, now we're ready to predict the person's height based on the femur length of 42 or whatever, 43. Let's do 43. Okay, it was 166.39, exactly what we had obtained and what all we've done previously, Okay. Okay, now 
we also can plot this on top of the original data. I already uh, put this in for you. So this is our solution without using polyval, without using polyfit. We programmed the matrix, we derived that matrix, and we showed it's doing exactly what Python is doing. If you end up developing something for Python, you need to know this stuff, right? So that's why we learn it too, okay? Yes? Mm -hmm. But that same derivation is going to result in a different system, which we're going to derive, which is going to continue. We're going to build up now over this. Yeah, yeah, but exactly the same derivation. You minimize over, you got it. I mean, you minimize over all the parameters, ds by da1, ds by da2, ds by da3, whatever parameters you have. You write all of those equations. That Those are the equations that govern your parameters. But then there's going to be, for linear regression at least, there's going to be a way to go around that nasty summation and its derivatives, okay? But if I give it to you now, you're gonna be like all up in arms. Where did we get that matrix and that formula? So we, we will get to that. It will simplify things quite a bit. But for nonlinear models, you need to carry out these derivations, okay? Okay, this is pretty cool, pretty powerful. All right, and right on time, okay? Thank you guys, I'll see you on Thursday.